chemical reactions seem to move in two directions. Indeed, chemists believe that even when they appear to be stopped, both forward and reverse reactions continue, balancing each other out in a state called dynamic equilibrium. By using a collision model, we can explain how individual molecules acquire enough energy as motion to undergo one reaction and also its reverse. Just how useful is this rather crude ping pong model? Here's a puzzle. Store in darkness, hydrogen gas, and chlorine gas. Years may pass, and only a minimal amount of hydrogen chloride forms. But expose them briefly to sunlight. Why do some reactions happen more quickly than others? To find simple answers, we ironically need a more complicated model. Consider a mole of hydrogen gas mixed with chlorine in the dark. That's Avogadro's number of molecules, and each of them makes billions of collisions a second. Under identical conditions, we might expect every hydrogen molecule to be identical to every other, and the same for chlorine molecules. And yet, the behavior of some suggests that they are not identical. A very few carry enough energy to create a new bonding arrangement. Therefore, hydrogen chloride is slowly formed. Perhaps it's a mistake to consider these individual molecules identical at all. Let's invest each molecule with a distinguishing characteristic. Call it kinetic energy. And see if we can find evidence that otherwise identical molecules have different kinetic energies. In a partial vacuum, two disks are attached to a common axle. Tin is heated until it forms a vapor. The disks are rotated at high speed. And the tin vapor diffuses from the chamber, passing through the slit. If all the molecules moved at the same speed, they should arrive at the disk on the same spot. But that's not what happens. The fastest molecules arrive first. In other words, those with the highest kinetic energy. Those with lower kinetic energy arrive later. Transfer this evidence to a slope representing energy. Like skiers on a hill, there are a few high energy hot doggers. Many middle of the road skiers in the middle of the hill. And a few low energy duds shiver at the bottom. Adding more energy to the system will bulldoze the entire population further up the hill. But the distribution pattern of energies remains somewhat similar. This pattern suggests a crude way of explaining the rate of a reaction. Find the point on the slope above which the molecules have enough energy to react. Those above this energy threshold have what is called threshold or activation energy. If few have the activation energy, the reaction proceeds slowly. Add enough energy to bulldoze many above the threshold and the reaction will speed up. A nice idea, but alas, still not sufficient to explain why hydrogen and chlorine explode. A tiny squirt of sunlight energy is far too small to move the entire population over the barrier. Yet, in reality, somehow they seem to find their own way over the top and into a reaction. But how is this possible? Our model, it seems, is still too simple. We have so far ignored the fact 
that the downhill energy slide of reacting molecules releases energy which influences other molecules. Let's try a slightly more complex model, a chain mechanism that describes how kinetic energy is acquired and passed on to other molecules in a reaction. For example, one lazy chlorine molecule with little kinetic energy is struck with a photon of light energy coming through the window. It absorbs the energy and the molecule breaks apart. A nearby hydrogen molecule is then torn apart when struck by one of these chlorine atoms to form hydrogen chloride, releasing energy and an extra hydrogen atom. This activated hydrogen atom may collide with a chlorine molecule, creating more hydrogen chloride and freeing chlorine to continue the cycle. Sooner or later, an atom will meet its mate, ending the chain. Because of this chain mechanism, a small input of energy can carry a few molecules over the reaction threshold, releasing more energy, which may be recycled to provide activation energy for still more molecules. If enough energy is input, and in turn released by the formation of new molecules, sufficient energy may become available for the reaction to become self-sustaining, even violent. Which explains how this becomes this. A graph of the energy pathway, followed by reaction, can help us understand not only the rates of reaction, but the difference between exothermic and endothermic reactions. No reaction can take place until this amount of activation energy is put into the system. The total energy released is this amount. Since the total energy release exceeds the activation energy, the reaction as a whole gives off this much heat. So it is exothermic dead simple, and just as easy now to understand an endothermic reaction. An endothermic reaction is an exothermic reaction in reverse. The only real difference is that the total energy released during a reaction is less than the total activation energy. This heat must be supplied to keep the reaction going. And where is the heat coming from? In this case, from you. You are supplying the energy from your body to push the molecules of the reaction over the threshold. Within every set of reactions, an exothermic reaction fuels a reverse endothermic reaction to eventually balance out in dynamic equilibrium. This more complicated model helps us explain reaction rates and endothermic reactions. Is it all we need? What causes a reaction to balance at just this point and not some other? Suppose we were to play with the concentration of reactants or add pressure. There are many facets of chemical equilibrium still to explore. <laughs>